Hello, and welcome to our series on the wisdom of Shakespeare, part of our broader series here at Olivier Mythodrama on archetypal wisdom, this time from the Shakespearean perspective. My name is Ben Walden, and I'm a founding associate of Olivier Mythodrama and also the director of our classic programs. We've worked with the plays of Shakespeare for almost 20 years now, looking at themes that have resonance for our own lives and for aspects of leadership. Now, obviously, Shakespeare's world externally was very different from ours in many ways, but the great Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi called Shakespeare a master of the human heart. And when it comes to the internal feeling states and uh, motivations that drive so much of our external action, he remains a figure of almost unparalleled insight and perception. He seems to have understood archetypal psychology almost instinctively. He would never have called it that. His work was 300 years before Carl Jung. Uh, but the plays are full of references and indeed sometimes even inspired by um, classical stories and their accompanying images. Sometimes it even just bursts clearly out onto the page. In Love's Labour's Lost, for instance, Longueville is described as a man of sovereign parts. Jaquez refers, in As You Like It, to the lover as a whole stage of human development, though he's referring to it much more in its romantic context rather than from the broader aspects we would bring perhaps to the archetype. And Henry V describes himself to the governor of Arfleur by saying, As I am a soldier, a name which in my thoughts becomes me best, with true uh, warrior expression. We see these archetypes mix and swirl and move through the characters and their behaviour right throughout the Shakespearean canon. Sometimes they're used to, for tremendous good, and to tremendous effect, and sometimes they're used to great harm, but they always seem to present immense potential power in either the right or the wrong hands. We'll be focusing primarily on the plays that we have looked at most consistently over the last 20 years. In Julius Caesar, the political world rocks on its axis to the power of compelling narrative. Mark Antony overthrows the best laid plans of the political ruling class around him with the brilliant ability he has in the archetype of the storyteller. How often have we seen that be influential in our own world where the power of compelling narrative that appeals to the heart as well as to the mind can win out over clear strategic planning, or indeed even data, sometimes to our detriment, but often with great effect because of the skills that compelling narrative brings. And how do we marry that with ethical integrity? And how do we also balance that with another key element of the play, which Cassius provides in the great skills of the strategist? to align a team behind a common purpose, to build an effective coalition and to mobilize that coalition towards the ends he wishes to achieve. In The Tempest, Prospero conjures a great storm that brings many disparate figures from his life to the same island of exile on which he lives. But in constellating this great storm, he finds that no one can escape its transformational process, including himself. As the play progresses, even he realises he'll have to throw away a lot of his rough magic and old tricks in order to serve the greater development of the group that unfolds around him and develops around him. In As You Like It, Rosalind offers us an entirely different version of community from that which obviously has been practiced in the court around her in the world she came from, cast out into the forest and partly through the mixture of her own passion 
and her ability to really seek for the truth, the deeper truth that people are trying to express. She proves a wonderful facilitator of a different kind of community in which the whole group engages in a richer process by being able to speak truthfully about its diversity and its different perceptions and opinions. And in Henry V, a young warrior shows us that the great skills of the sovereign are by no means that of an age, but much more of an archetype. Henry, who's had a very dissolute youth, has to bring a purpose and a maturity to his attitude, a sense of purpose and a vision of what he wants to achieve, and he unites a disparate group around it through the power of that vision and his ability to radiate it and communicate it. But this alone is not enough for him. Despite a carefully laid strategic plan and his brilliant ability to motivate even the most hardened warriors on his team, and he has plenty of them on his team, he still himself cannot escape a great trans transformation on the field of Agincourt, almost an initiation for him. The night before the battle, when all vanities are stripped away and the English force are wildly outnumbered, Henry is left with two choices, either to run away and abandon everything he claimed he was in his service to the group, or to deliver an authentic presence that can reassure them and sustain himself at a time of great fear, uncertainty and doubt. We'll also be speaking to a number of figures through the podcast who we have worked with or who are friends of ours, who we think have uh, real insight into this discussion. And we'll be offering you snippets and sections of plays that we think show the archetypal qualities moving to great effect or being used and employed to great effect uh, by certain characters in certain situations. And the aim of all of this is to create an exploration through the podcast that can offer insight, inspiration, and also help us to really develop ourselves, the teams we work with, and the wider world around us. I really hope you enjoy the podcast. 